hello, good morning. Um, hello, good morning. Uh, again, my apologies for the um, delay in the beginning of the of the summer school. Uh, we now have uh, Francisco Perez. Uh, he's a PhD student at the uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is going to be the moderator for the inaugural session. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much, all of you, for for coming here, and we hope that uh, we have a very engaging week of discussions. Francisco. Good morning, everyone. Happy to see you all here. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Richard Kozel Wright, um, who's the head here of the Globalization Division at UNCTAD, um, also a, a UMass alum. And uh, Richard, take it away. Uh, thank you, Francisco, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, you're guinea pigs of a sort, because we've no, we, this is the first time UNCTAD has done a summer school with INET. Uh, I guess the, the wrinkle that we've added, which I hope will be of interest to everybody, is not only to bring the traditional INET scholars who are largely in academia, but also to mix that with uh, people from our community, people from missions and from uh, uh, development organizations uh, back in capital. So that's a, a mix that we hope will produce some different types of conversation over the uh, next uh, five days. So I, ca I have to leave it for China at some point. So I, unfortunately, I can't be with you all the time, but I'm sure it will be a, an interesting, interesting and productive uh, week uh, of, of exchanges. Uh, I should thank Ina, of course, for the work that that they put into organizing this, particularly to, to Daniel, who was the counterpart on our side, and I'm sure the person who was harassing you with lots of emails over the course of the last uh, month or so. So, so particular thanks to, to Daniel. Um, what Daniel didn't do was really kind of tell me how to kick this off, um, which is a slight gap in his, in, 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 in his planning. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk very generally about issues that I think might be of relevance to this uh, weeks of, of lectures and, and also to, I guess, can you hit the next slide? It's gone. That's the and also to introduce you a little bit to what we do in UNCTAD, which I thought many of you may, I hope, know our work, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a, of a flavor of the kind of work that we do. Um, and here, and the, and the context in which in which we do it. So uh, uh, there's 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 f basically five broad issues and five musical themes that I've attached to that. You can work out who the you can work out my musical tastes from from the uh, from the songs from the songs I picked. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the current context. It seems appropriate. Uh, now, what's the last 10 years? Um, UNCTAD obviously has been immersed in that, like, well, like many of you have, in the research that you do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about UNCTAD's approach. I couldn't decide between Public Enemy and Green Day which was the most appropriate song for UNCTAD, so I put them both in. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the international order and some of the, the general problems of the international order and, and the way in which those problems have led to what we call hyperglobalization. And I'll say a little bit about what we understand by hyperglobalization and the work that we've been doing in that context. And I'll, I'll end with a little indication of, the, of where we're taking the kind of work we're doing in, in my division um, over the next, over the, over the coming period. Um, I, I, I guess everyone here is, is very familiar with the, with the financial crisis. Um, you all know that Disruption, uh, disruptions in a very small part of the, of the U.S. housing market, the subprime market, in 2007, essentially lit a fuse which triggered a series of increasingly loud bangs, beginning with Northern Rock and through Best, the, 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 the bankruptcy of Bear Stearns, through Freddie Mae and, and Freddie Mac, um, and, of course, ending with a very large explosion almost 10 years ago uh, this month. 
uh, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the panic in financial markets that, that uh, followed that. Um, governments were at a loss to know what to do. The great philosopher king of the day, uh, George W. Bush, in his famous words, this sucker could go down was the way in which the governments were looking at the problem in September 2000 and 2008. Um, economists, of course, who had, who had really kind of become uh, important players in, 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 in thinking about economic issues over the previous two or three decades, were equally at a loss to know, to explain this, they basically they'd been telling the world that we were going through a great moderation and that everything was more or less hunky-dory, you know. So, so when the Queen asked why no one saw this coming, they didn't know. You know. It wasn't an innocent question for the Queen. She lost 25 million <laughs> pounds in the process, so it wasn't quite an innocent question on her part. But the economists basically, and they blamed everybody, no, nobody knew was the answer from the Royal Economic Society once the Queen had asked that. So if, 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 you know, if everyone's to blame, no one's to blame, of course, for, for the financial crisis. But we, we, you know Greenspan in his famous testimony, testimony uh, apologized for not seeing a flaw in the system. Gordon Brown made mea culpas. Dominic Strauss-Kahn, when he was... Uh, an acceptable part of the international community made similar s similar apologies. So e economists, you know, were, were, uh, were as, as, as much as a, as a loss as, as were policymakers when the crisis hit. Um, and, and, you know, the belief, there was a belief, at least in 2009, 2010, that there was a, a serious redirection of the economy was needed, radical surgery would be needed to, to uh, put put things uh, back in place, collective action, no country could solve this by itself, that collective action was required. And we saw elements of this, the G20 became the, the new forum for discussing international issues. I mean, the international community was so disrupted by this, they even asked the United Nations to get involved <laughs> in thinking about the problems. We, we had a, a, a global financial crisis conference in 2009, Joe Stiglitz set up a, a commission to provide s secretarial support for that uh, conference. And, of course, INET was created. I mean, out of that, out, you're here because of that, because, because it was Soros' response to the events and particularly the failure of economists that inspired him to, to, to create uh, uh, INET. So, so, in a sense, you're all here you know, because of, 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 that, of, of, the, of those events. Uh, next slide, I guess. Um, we n and we know what governments essentially did eventually in response to, in, in response to this state of panic. Um, central banks pumped in trillions of dollars of liquidity uh, to save the, the banks. The, the, the Federal Reserve de facto became the lender of last resort for the global economy. Uh, Adam Tooze, in his new book, Crashed, has an excellent discussion of, of what, that what that meant, um, both economically and politically, for those that are, that are interested. I believe INET are creating a, a, new, a new kind of study group on Tooze's book, Crashed, which has just been, which has just been re released. So we, we th that was the, the focus for, eventually became the focus for, for saving the, the system. There has been some regulation since then, um, clamping down on, on, most, on the most toxic behavior that characterized the, the financial system, um, improving capital in banks and, and some systemically important uh, in, uh, financial institutions. No criminalization. Of, how could you criminalize these people? If everybody was to blame and no one was to blame, you couldn't really pick on anybody. So criminalization, unlike the 1930s, was not part of the of the response um, to the crisis, but there has been, and there's a big debate. And I guess you, you'll be talking about the kinds of regulatory responses to the financial crisis in some of the in some of the lectures that you have uh, over the over the coming week. Uh, 
Uh, and then thirdly, the third response, which is the most egregious in many respects, is the way in which the debate was somehow turned upside down from a crisis that was caused by financial markets and private financial institutions. It became a problem caused by or related to excessive government spending and behavior. Um, and, and the warning eventually that if we don't change, then everyone will become like Greece, essentially. And, uh, and econo economists, of course, are back on comfortable ground there because they know, they know how to deal with excessive government behavior. They, they introduce austerity. That's what economists have a, a pat response to. So, so austerity becomes the third leg of the, of the, of the response to the global crisis um, after, after 2000, after the initial attempt to, uh, and, and some successful attempt to, uh, uh, to um, introduce uh, fiscal expansion in 2009 uh, to into 2010, the most, poli most countries and policymakers re reverted to austerity as the default macroeconomic position to deal with the crisis or the, the, the collateral damage from the crisis. Um, and the score, uh, and we can debate, and as I guess you will, the, the scorecard uh, of that of those of those kinds of responses to the crisis. If you believe the conventional wisdom, then we've averted a repeat of the 1930s. Unemployment has been tackled. Um, the financial system is simpler, safer, and fairer, in the words of Mark Carney as head of the Financial Stability Board. Asset markets have rebounded. Greece has made it, according to Donald Tusk. Um, and there's signs of a synchronized recovery in the global economy. At least that was what the IMF was saying when I was at the, uh, at the, at the um, fall meetings in Washington last year. Now, the other side of that story, of course, is that, is that the, the recovery that we've seen over the last six or seven years has been the slowest on record. Wages have been stagnant in most economies, particularly advanced economies, but not only throughout this period. Social services are being slashed. For those, I guess, coming from the US and the UK, that's a familiar story, but it's not unique to the Anglo-Saxon world. We are seeing already signs of kind of morbidity in the financial si system, the cryptocurrency boom and bust, the influence and rise of, of shadow banking um, as, as a feature of the, of, of the, of the financial system, uh, et cetera. Uh, we are now, of course, seeing emerging markets in trouble. I don't have to tell many of the people here, Argentina, Turkey, uh, are in already in serious trouble, and there are many other emerging economies on the cusp of being in, in serious trouble. <coughs> Multilateralism is crisis, having saved the system. Uh, in 2008, 2009, we see a multilateral system in a state of disrepair, or if not disarray. Particularly when it comes to trade, in this town, we get that feeling on a daily basis. Um, and economics hasn't changed, which I guess is also why you're here, because there's a frustration among particularly heterodox economists that the economics profession, despite all the talk in 2008, 2009, that we, 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 you know, we need to think about the profession and, and why it can't see the big developments uh, that w before they take place. Um, but, but at least my impression, and I guess most of yours, is that the economics profession profession hasn't changed uh, sufficiently. So, you know, th we have to debate the pros and cons of that record when, when, when um, in the kind of research that and work that we do uh, in, 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 in UNSAC. The one, yeah, the next one. The ne obviously, the one thing that has changed quite dramatically is the political landscape. Um, and in particular, the rise of what the people are calling populism and the revert to a much more nationally oriented political and therefore economic agenda. Um, and and I, I don't need to 
uh, give you the the blow by blow of the of the political circumstances in your own countries. But this is a, 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 a large trend. And now, personally, I don't find populism to be a particular particularly useful concept for thinking about political change. Um, what what strikes me is what we're looking at, interestingly, is a drain. Once, uh, one of the features, of you, as you all know, of the financial crisis is that trust drained from the financial system. Financial systems are built on trust, and once trust goes from the system, then the crisis really d does begin to, to take grip. There's a very nice little video on the Financial Times website by Gillian Tett, uh, who is an anthropologist by training, so kind of gets these issues better than most economists, I think, uh, ab about the role of trust in the explaining the financial crisis. Very nice, worth five minutes long. It's nice, nice little video that's worth, worth, worth watching. What we've seen, though, since then is the draining of trust from the political system. And that, is the con that strikes me as being the real common feature that we see uh, across both the developed and the in the developing world in the, the post-crisis uh, era. Um, of course, it's not how it's being presented by the mainstream. The mainstream is that populism is about fake news and uh, irrational uh, charismatic figures who can somehow mislead the population. That's, that's the kind of, that's, that's the kind of uh, rhetoric that's pr presented, and in our world, that translates in the need to save the 70-year international liberal economic order that is now under threat as a consequence of uh, these political shifts that we're se seeing. Now, the problem with that argument is a simple one. The liberal international economic order died 35 years ago. So saving a zombie... Uh, uh, system is not something that I consider to be a particularly progressive agenda. And it, it died for the reasons that I think most of the people here know. Once, once the Bretton Woods system collapsed, we saw the end of capital close and the surging of financial, uh, cross-border financial flows. We saw the end of full employment as a policy goal, which was the bedrock of the international economic order that was created uh, in 1945. I mean, that was for Keynes and Harry Dexter White and the people who forged the international economic order after the Second World War. Full employment had to be up front and center as the key uh, uh, objective of policymakers. That died in, 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 in the second half of the 70s in most advanced economies. We've seen the end of the mixed economy, the idea that you had to find a balance between the state and the market uh, the public and the private sectors, the, the idea has disappeared from the discourse of the uh, uh, international economic discussions in over the last 30 years. And with that, the idea that you have alternative development paths, which was, which was also part of the discussion in the early 1940s and, 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 and early 19, uh, in, the, in the late 1940s and early 90s. That's gone too. There's no, dis no there's one size fits all. Um, and, and in a sense, we've seen the end of managed trade. GATT, the, GATT, the GATT system, and it, which had big weaknesses, which I'll talk about, was, um, was a managed trading system. The, the creation of the WTO was not a managed trading system. It was a free trading system. I mean, y you go back to the debates in the 19, late 1940s on the creation of what was then an international trade um, organization, the ITO, which became GATT. But th every, everybody knew, not just people like Keynes, people like Jacob Viner, the, the well-known Chicago economist, leading free trade. He, he, he said, free trade is dead. No one, no one takes free trade seriously in the late 1940s, early 1950s as a way of thinking about uh, international trading issues. So, so all the all the stuff that made the international or order what it was in the in the 50s and 60s went a long time ago. So the idea that we're saving a 70-year system, or we need to save a 70-year system, I think is a very misleading way of presenting the challenges facing uh, the the multilateral order. 
there's a kind of existential question I put at the end of us, whether it's also not the end of these things, but was it the end of UNCTAD too at the, in, at the end of the 1970s and into the 1980s? And so that gives me a nice segue for giving you a, a, a brief introduction to what, to what it is that UNCTAD does and why we haven't quite ended our, 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 our role in the, in the global uh, development discussions uh, yet. Um, yeah, next slide. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of UNCTAD. There's a couple of very nice books for those people that are interested in the history of the organization. One is, one is by John Toy and Richard Toy. You may know John. John actually worked in UNCTAD. He had my job in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So he, he comes, he comes at, it's, it's a very scholarly account of the way in which different economists shaped the UN uh, development agenda, beginning with Nicky Caldor's work in, 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 in the 1940s on the Trade and Employment Conference, Koletsky and that, that group that was in the UN in the, in the mid to late 1940s, and ending up with the Trade and Development Report and, 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 and work that is still being done around development in the UN uh, context. Very nice, kind of very scholarly history of thought <coughs> type book. The other book that's worth reading on this is Mark Mazow's mm -hmm. Governing the World. Which is a more, um, which is more of a discussion of the political context uh, behind the shaping of the post-war international economic order, and is is one that I recommend. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into their kind of details. Just w one of the things we always get, though, and particularly in the work that we do, is why why are you working on money and finance? You're a trade organisation. What is a trade organisation doing, working on? money and finance. That's, we get this from our, from our partners from the advanced economies who, who don't think we should be working on money and finance, basically. That's, so that's, the, bu that's the business of the IMF and the World Bank and, and other bodies. So why is UNCTAD, and, and of course, you know, I, I think to understand, it, next slide, I think you just, I guess we just need a kind of positioning of UNCTAD in the, and, and where it comes from. You know the basic nature of the post-war international order, Bretton Woods, IMF, World Bank. Um, attempts, though, in the 1950s, because the feeling already as developing countries became politically independent, was that those institutions had fundamentally been set up to deal, which is the case, with the problems of the advanced economies. They were not completely. Eric Halina has written a beautiful book called The Forgotten Origins of the Bretton Woods institutions, which is about the role of developing countries in the Bretton Woods Conference. It's, it's a very nice book. But by and large, it is the case that the Bretton Woods institutions, as they took shape, were dealing with the problems of advanced economies. Developing countries, as they became politically independent, were frustrated by this. There were attempts in the 1950s to create a special fund for development inside the United Nations that would deal with long-term financing of developing country problems. It failed. Uh, the attempt to do that essentially, uh, essentially, failed. John Toy has a discussion of that. In the case of the of trade, the International Trade Organization was explicitly created by developing countries. The, the vast majority of signatories to the Havana Charter in 1948 were developing countries. And if you look at the Havana Charter, it has a very strong development component. The, the Havana Charter and the idea of an international trade organization was essentially killed in the US Congress in the late 1940s, early 1950s, they refused to, to vote on it and it died. What survived was GATT, which were the negotiations on <coughs> liberalizing uh, tariffs. Again, with a very strong developed country uh, focus and there were attempts in the GATT to introduce more of a friend, development friendly dimension. The Habler Report was published in 1958 which was their attempt within the GATT to bring development into their work, failed largely. I mean, you can look at the history in places, but it essentially failed. In terms of, of course, the other big initiative in, in the multilateral system after the end of the Second World War was the Marshall Plan, and, uh, which is an amazing, uh, which is a real, genuinely amazing um, uh, uh, aid effort orchestrated by the U.S., but by the late 50s, that the, the values and the impetus behind Mar the Marshall Plan had died, and it had been replaced by pretty pitiful bilateral aid relationships and a focus on foreign direct investment. 
and, and again, developing countries did not feel that the kind of aid system was – so none of the n – neither the financial system nor the trade system nor the uh, development cooperation system were really working for developing countries. And, and, and so lots of agitation. It's out of that agitation that essentially UNCTAD was formed. So, uh, so in the early 1960s when John F. Kennedy introduced his um, – uh, was instrumental in, in creating a UN development decade, s essentially saying, look, developing countries, if they're going to address the kinds of problems that they all face, need to be growing at 5% five, five a year. UNCTAD kind of picked, essentially picked that, that idea up and asked, well, what does it take in terms of an international architecture for developing countries to, to grow at 5 6% a year? And, and the answer, of course, was, and, and what Prebish brought into the discussion, was that, that growing at that kind of rate a year runs very quickly into balance of payments problems in developing countries. They very quickly face, they very quickly suck in more imports than they can export. And, and you're going to have to deal with that. If you're serious about 5 or 6 or 7 percent, we, UNCTAD was more ambitious. They, they thought 7 percent was a more realistic target in terms of, of addressing developing country problems. You, you can't ignore that, those kinds of, of, of constraints, uh, balance of payment, the balance of payments constraint that these countries face. And, and very quickly, when, when you bring in the balance of payments constraints, you start to look at other constraints and biases and asymmetries in the workings of the of global markets and the international division of labor which impede uh, developing countries from from achieving those kinds of of growth uh, targets um, yeah next and 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 you know and, and the and the record what came out essentially from Prebish's work that he'd been doing and remember Prebish was not a trade he can't Pre Prebish was a central banker he came at the development challenge from a financing perspective. And what he understood and what UNCTAD was set up to do was to, 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 to uh, link the different components of the international economy into a coherent vision. So the idea that trade, finance, technology, foreign investment are all interdependent was an essential component of trying to address the systemic uh, constraints and biases that, that stop developing countries from essentially from, ca from catching up. So interdependence, interdependence both in terms of those uh, components of the global economy and interdependence between countries. Of course, Prebish was famous for introducing the idea of a core and a periphery into the debate and the idea that these were not mutually exclusive parts of the global economy but were intimately connected and intim intimately connected in asymmetric ways, that is what the core does, has a much more significant influence on how the periphery can operate than vice versa. So the idea of interdependence was always hardwired into a serious development agenda coming out of the weaknesses of the system that was, that w that was in place in the 1950s and early 1960s. And UNCTAD's job was essentially from the get-go to try and, it was a very positive agenda, to, to try and change the rules of the game. Not to kind of ex blow up the system, but to, to in change the rules of the game in all these different areas in ways that made it easier for developing countries uh, to grow and diversify, get out of commodity dependence into industrial development, et cetera. And when you look at UNCTAD's work in the, before 1990, that's essentially what you will see, a, 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 an agenda that is not simply focused on trade, although we have very important uh, obviously very important components of our work were in, in the area of trade, the, inter the integrated program on commodities, the generalized system of, of preferences. These were all impo important parts of, of UNCTAD work, but we were involved with the design of special drawing rights in the late 1960s. UNCTAD was intimately involved in those discussions that were taking place in the, in the IMF. We did we introduced, which is still on the books of the General Assembly, rules for controlling restrictive business practices, the, 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 the way in which large international firms can distort international markets. I'm going to come back to that later. We did a code of conduct on technology transfer. Uh, you can see, I mean, this is, a very, this is a very kind of comprehensive and integrated type of development agenda that uh, UNCTAD was set up to do, culminating, of course, in the work on the new international economic order, which is what 
w which was the big effort in the, in the developing countries, by developing countries in the United Nations to change the rules of the game through negotiations. That was the, the aim, to, to renegotiate the rules of the global economy. Um, and I guess the, uh, I'll come to post-1990. I guess the, the bottom line, of, so two things. We've always worked on money and finance. So in response to my, my friends from developed countries who are, why are you working on, we've always worked on money and finance. And in most, in most of these cases, we were ahead of the game. The, the IMF didn't work on debt issues as UNCTAD was struggling with those in the 1970s. So we've all, they're integral to the kind of integrated perspective that UNCTAD was set up by developing countries to pursue in the international agenda. Um, but in a certain sense, we lost. We, we lost. The new international economic order, I think next slide. Um, the new international economic order failed. I mean, that's the politically failed. Um, the main reason, I think the main reason it failed was the debt crisis of the early, 19, the early 1980s, the 1970s, you know, developing countries because of the recycling of petrodollars and other things found themselves suddenly having access to international finance. A lot of them borrowed heavily on the expectation that commodity prices, which was still their main source of foreign exchange, was the, was the, um, w w were going to be continuously rising. Interest, real interest rates were negative. It was a kind of no-brainer to go uh, and borrow uh, on international capital markets in the 1970s, and many countries borrowed excessively in that period. Of course, when, when, the, when the advanced economies who s were suffering from their own problems of stagflation decided they need to, to take a, a different kind of route, and Volcker being instrumental in, in raising uh, U.S. interest rates and then global interest rates, uh, putting the U.S. economy into recession, uh, commodity prices collapsed, these countries were squeezed. The developing countries that have borrowed heavily were were squeezed, and you got a debt crisis across large parts of the developing world, which forced them, essentially crudely forced them into the arms of the Washington-based uh, institutions, at which point the Washington institutions were in a very powerful position to impose a very different kind of development agenda from the one that the developing countries had been pursuing over the pre previous couple of, of decades. And you all know that agenda because it's been termed the Washington uh, consensus, and you have the ingredients of that consensus on the board, and you have the f quote by Williamson um, about what, what he thought, John Williamson, who coined the phrase, about what he thought he was doing in terms of pursuing the, the idea of a, of a Washington consensus, market discipline, a market-based a market economy, openness to the world. Um, Etc. Uh, next slide. I'm not sure. What and, and I guess that, I mean, that was the basis for a fundamental, that was the beginnings of a very fundamental change, not only in, in, in the ideology um, behind development thinking and the rise of neoliberalism, but more generally in the way in which policymakers across the world uh, thought about the, 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 di the direction and the challenges which they face. It's usually framed as a state versus market. I guess that's how most people think about neoliberalism. It's, it's wrong, actually. Neoliberalism is not a state versus market agenda. Strong states are required for the neoliberal agenda. It's much more about capital and the movement of capital. The, the real motivating force behind the neoliberal agenda is um, it's a pro-business pro-capital mobility agenda. And that's not quite the same as state versus market. You get a sense of this kind of shift of, this is one of my favorite, I always, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes on, of, of the kind of hyper-globalization troubadours who trip around the world singing its praises at every gathering in mountain, mountainous resorts and beach resorts across the world. And this is, this, is, this is, I hear people say, we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well, deb you, can, you can read it. I mean, I, when I read it, I, I can hear the person saying it. I don't, you can, I don't know if anyone would like to, to take a guess at which, 
particular person this is? Tony Blair, the one and only Tony Blair. That's who it is. And it, uh, but you could find you could find similar quote, and it's it's very much a very different way of thinking of, about the policy challenges that uh, countries needed to pursue if they were to benefit from a more open um, a, a more open global economy. Um, but it's it's a bit mis. I mean. And, and this is where we get into the work that we've been doing and, and lots of people around this room have been doing it. Uh, as I said, it's not really state versus market doesn't capture the shift in the direction of economic thinking and the dynamics of national and international uh, development at that time. What really becomes the driving force for that in this period is uh, finance and the deregulation of financial markets the growing significance of financial institutions and what people, and I guess you're going to, I think Gary might be talking about this, the notion of financialization as being a whole new way about, of organizing economic life and indeed beyond economic life, political life as well. I think next, next slide. I, and I, oh, next slide, actually, I'll come back to the paradox. Um, so, and... and, and Financialization isn't just about the importance of financial markets. Uh, that, I think that's the important thing to understand, or, the, or even the, the rise of, of cross-border financial flows, even those, though those are very significant, significant parts of the story. It's a much more, it's more structural, it's more behavioral. It's really about a fundamental change in the way in which economic life is structured and, and, and these are the kinds of issues that we think need to be discussed when it comes to, to financialization and I think Gary will be, will be picking up um, many of these issues um, when, when he talks about this in, in his presentation. But a lot of the work that UNCTAD has been doing over the last couple of decades has been around trying to understand the way in which financialization has impacted on growth and development opportunities in the in the developing world that's a lot of the work we do and we've been we've been skeptical for a very long time i mean if you go back to our 1997 trade and development report so 20 years ago where we i think where we were looking particularly at the way in which finance was feeding into a story which is now familiar but wasn't then which is rising inequality so the way in which fin these financialization pressures will, and, and no one was talking about inequality back then, nobody. And I think the 97 TDR is seminal by making that connection, but not only making that connection, essentially warning that if you go this route for too long, there will be a massive backlash against this kind of globalization. So I think, I, I think we, it's something we, we like to be a, try and think of ourselves as being ahead of the curve when it comes to development thinking, and I think we were, we were probably too far ahead of the curve then because we sounded like we were mavericks. Um, but we did warn about these kinds of relationships already uh, back in, in 97, and you know, the links between inequality, instability, indebtedness, and insufficient investment in this financializing world has been at the core of the kind of research that we've been doing in the trade and development report and other parts of the, of the division um, that, that you will get a flavor of from colleagues who make presentations uh, here over the next couple of days. Let's just go back a second. A paradox, uh, paradoxes, I, 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 this comes from the work, at the, my, my presentations last week in your counterparts, in the, the YSI program in um, the University of Geneva because the work of the University of Geneva comes out of a very good economic historian called Paul Bayrock, who was a, a teacher at the uni And Paul used to um, approach the issue of using economic history to illustrate contemporary challenges through the, through the lens of myths and paradoxes. He thought that e economic, the use of economic history in much of contemporary discussion was based around myths and paradoxes. And one of the paradoxes that we have had, we came to, we, we faced in the early discussions of hyperglobalization was of course East Asia and the East Asian miracle. Because lots of people were using East Asia to justify this change of policies 
towards in a, in a more neoliberal direction. So East Asian economies were apparently successful because they used, they used the market, they, they reduced the role of the state, and they opened up to international capital. That's, that was the story that came out of the World Bank and, 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 and other institutions to justify the kinds of policies that they were imposing on other developing countries. And of course, it's rubbish. Uh, you know, and, and we, were not, we were not original thinkers in this. I'm sure a lot of you have read the work of Alice Amsden and Robert Wade and Harjun Chang about how, in fact, these were highly dependent on highly interventionist states to be able to do what they were doing. And, and, and interestingly, the work that we did, as, as you, again, I'm sure you know, the World Bank came up with its definitive account of this experience in something called the East Asian Miracle Study that was bankrolled by the Japanese government. And, the Jap and they came up with the, the story that uh, it's, it's all, industrial policy was irrelevant. It was all about them uh, getting their prices right and opening up to big bu international business. That was the story. Uh, and, and the Japanese weren't happy with that. And the Japanese actually gave UNCTAD money to provide a second opinion on what happened in East Asia, which we kindly obliged them with. And you can find that work, again, resonating through the Trade and Development Report and other, we did a Journal of Development Studies, we did something in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. We, we put out a lot of the work that we did there. So, so that, that's, that's a paradox that we had to come to terms with in the early stages of the debates on hyper-globalization and I hope tried to show that the, the, fa the fake news coming out of Washington was indeed fake news. Um, uh, uh, you, you all know the great moderation uh, story. I, I, I don't. I don't want to go there. Um, to, to go that. Uh, to go that route. So, so, so. I mean, th so we were doing. We've been doing this work now on the links, trying to show how hyperglobalization not only creates these um, systemic problems around inequality, indebtedness, etc but also has, and a lot of that work, of course, has been done in the advanced economies, but has also created very uneven and distorted development uh, processes um, as, it, as it has unfolded, and in the process has often captured the multilateral system, and the multilateral institutions have been complicit in promoting this kind of uh, hyperglobalization agenda, in our opinion, to the detriment of many developing, developing countries. And it, it, of course, it comes back in an interesting way through the trade story, because one of the, one of the um, how am I doing for time, Daniel? Oh, I've got time. OK, well, I won't take that long. Um, one, of the, one of the central um, elements of the hyperglobalization agenda have, of course, been free trade agreements, uh, beginning with the shift from GATT to the WTO and the Uruguay Round, but much more significantly in a whole string of regional and bilateral free trade agreements that proliferated from the early 1990s onwards. Um, and, of course, the interesting thing for us when we visit those and, and what makes, again, this question of why is, um, does UNCTAD look at the issues of, of money and finance is that, of course, free trade agreements are none of those things, right? I, 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 I use the parallel. Voltaire made this famous statement that about the Holy Roman Empire, that the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. And we say the same thing about free trade agreements. Free trade, free trade agreements are not about freedom. They're about tying the hands of government. They're not about trade. They're about state ownership and uh, the movement of capital and intellectual property rights. And they're not about trade. And they're certainly not about agreements. They're based on lobbying and twisting arms of many developing countries. Um, so, so free trade agreements and the way in which, and of course, free, they're called, the, you, if you call these, even if you call them free capital agreements, people would get su suspicious immediately. If, you, if they were called free capital agreements, people would be, but free trade agreements sounds good because economists can pre present you with a very persuasive logic 
that free trade and comparative advantage is a win-win world. So there is a very strong ideological backing for free trade agreements that is more difficult to make when it comes to the movement of capital. Even free trade economists like Bhagwati are themselves suspicious of the free, the free movement of capital. So, so it, but, but they're not about, most of these agreements have not been about trade, they've been about money, capital, and finance, essentially. Um, so so we, we, that's another area of that we've tried to look at and to see in which, to look at the ways in which hyper-globalization has influenced policymaking and policy thinking through the proliferation of free trade agreements, and in particular the way in which those agreements have reduced the policy space available to developing countries to manage their integration into this hyper-globalized world in a way that reinforces kind of catch up and inclusive uh, 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 outcomes. Um, there, of course, is a second paradox for us in this story. So this is a fairly, a fairly negative take on the hyper-globalized world that has emerged over the last 20 or 30 years. There is, of course, a paradox, and that paradox is this idea of the rise of the South, which has become a very important part of the international discourse over the course of the last uh, two decades or so, and it begins with the, the idea of the BRICS as this kind of new, these new growth poles in the global economy. It, it's linked to this idea of decoupling that the IMF promoted and the World Bank in the uh, up to and beyond the financial crisis. That, gr that is, growth in the developing countries had become self-reinforcing and and, disc and, and unconnected from what was happening in the advanced economies, so they, they didn't have to worry so much about what was going on in the advanced economies. They could focus on their own internal growth dynamics, and out of that, a very an important discussion for us about the possibilities that opened up for South-South cooperation, as an not as an alternative, we say as a complement to the existing um, structures of development cooperation of a more for, of a more traditional type and north-south relationships, etc. So those have become very important part. And we, whilst there are important elements in this story, we have we have been we have not we have not dismissed this, but we've warned that there's a certain exaggeration to this story. And the exaggerations really are twofold. One is China. I mean most of the story, when you really drill down to the rise of the South is a China story. And if you, if you do a simple exercise, I don't have it here, if you look at, for example, the share of the BRICS in global output, I mean, you, you, you can do a little graph where the line goes up a lot. If you take out China and you're left with the ribs and you look at their, and you look at their uh, position in the, it's not so impressive. It's not that it, it's not that it hasn't happened. They ha there has been an increase in the ribs. Ribs have become stronger. But it's not, a, it's not a transformation of the kind that you hear in a lot of the discussion going on about the rise of the South. And, um, and of course, we know that China's rise was not only good for China. It took 700 billion people out of extreme poverty, which is phenomenally impressive, phenomenally impressive. And, and China has not only you know, been an anti-poverty agenda, it's been a development agenda in the sense that they've shifted the, the growth dynamic of their, they've made structural changes in their economy that has shifted the growth dynamic towards higher value added, high te higher technology, um, higher productivity, uh, economic activity. I mean, then that, and of course there were spillover effects that benefited many developing countries. The problem is most of those spillover effects came through commodity markets. So a lot of the strong growth performance in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, after 2003, and, and there has been strong growth in parts of sub-Saharan Africa since then, has been hugely dependent, hugely dependent on commodity prices with all the problems that that, with that, with that brings. So, so we've, we've tried to, we haven't, we haven't wanted to do dismiss the importance of that, although for us China is a continuation of the East Asian story as we told it back in the 1990s and early 2000s. But we, we, we don't, we're, not, we're not convinced that it's a kind of, the kind of breakthrough 
uh, for the South that it, it is often presented as. There are, there, are there are changes that we also work on, elements in the new financial architecture, the rise of these new financial institutions, the new development bank, the Asian infrastructure investment bank that have come as a consequence of, of, of these changes, wh which we think are important, mo again, not to the scale that makes for a major transformation, but they're signs of what could be done if things do move in a different direction direction more systematically. We have the Belt and Road Initiative from China um, and the whole issue of infrastructure-led growth. That, and, and we have a work on this in the forthcoming Trade and Development Report. I'll advertise that. It's out, next, it's out later this month for those people that follow these things. Um, and so we have a discussion of infrastructure-led growth. And we, we're beginning to see problems with that too. I'm sure you're all familiar with the difficulties involving uh, indebtedness that some countries on the Belt and Road, Sri Lanka being a, a prominent case, but Pakistan being another one, that we are beginning to see. And that's China's learning how to become an international player. I mean, it, China is a novice in this game, and it's learning. And, and we are involved with that by trying to provide research and policy support to countries involved in the Belt and Road initiative. We see this as a positive development, but we, we are cognizant of the challenges and dangers that are involved in that. So there is a paradox with the rise of the South. We have a unit that works on this. We have publications on this for those people that are interested. Some of my colleagues from that unit will be presenting some of their work to you uh, later in the in, in, in the summer school. Uh, next slide. I think I think I just I, I think yeah one of the things uh, so we've had this hyperglobalization story focused on the rise of neoliberal n neoliberalism as an ideo ideology and financialization as it's driving uh, as as the force really uh, driving it but there's another story that has begun to enter this dis discussion that we think is critical and really needs to be taken forward and that's you know hyperglobalization is not just about finance it's about big business and, and the role of large corporations in, shape, in, in shaping and reshaping the international division of labor and rigging international markets. And this has now become an issue that uh, we're, it's interesting. We're, we tried to pick up this story in last year's Trade and Development Report, and we thought it would get us into trouble because you're making, you know, it's back, in a way it's back to it's, it's a back to a discussion of development in the 1970s. It's partly the new international econo economic order discussion, right? And, w and when you got people like Steve Heimer working on the role of multinational corporations, not as kind of organizers of global value chains, uh, of global value chains, but of, of organizers of a hierarchy of power that worked to the disadvantage of those at the bottom of that hierarchy. That's Hyman's story about international, uh, international firms. And in a sense, we're moving back in that direction now. Now, of course, what was interesting for us when we presented this uh, I, in the US and, and elsewhere, the, the US, people in the US are beginning to worry about this in their own domestic. Con market concentration is becoming a political issue. Again, we've seen it in the US with with the Democratic Party and Elizabeth Warren and, and this w worrying about the, 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 in the adverse influence of the big, big digital companies. We see it with the whole debate about tax evasion and tax avoidance, uh, which is a global problem. We see it in the case of the European Commission with the work that, that with the challenges that they've imposed on Google and the fines that they've imposed on Google for distorting markets. Essentially, so so in fact, it's now becoming a, a, a big issue, and we we are we are work we are beginning to work on this issue. I, we, I, we think it's a critical issue. It it takes us into the world of uh, rent-seeking behavior and the way in which rents are becoming the normal business practice, particularly in very large international uh, firms, as a way of making profits. Um, Stiglitz is doing work on this. The people in INA are doing a lot of work in this. Uh, Adair Turner is talking about the zero-sum society. And, and, and so this, this, is, this is work that we are beginning to do. 
um, in, uh, as I said, last year's report. And we will continue to do, we, we kind of pick it up again in this year's trade and development report because it's not just about finance. It's not just about um, technology. It's also about international trade. People forget, it's the forgotten 1%, right? We all know who the 1% are, the, but in, in, in the world of international trade, the 1% the of, of, of top firms control the bulk of international trade. So something in the order of 55% of global trade is controlled by the top 1% of international firms. That is a huge amount of power that is brought to the shaping of the international trading system that has essentially gone unnoticed in the era of hyperglobalization and needs to be brought back into the onto the agenda and we will do that in in the um, in the in the uh, in the next PDR uh, last slide I think um, and, and uh, which really is just which is going back to uh, is, the, is, the, is where we're going in terms of the kind of research that we see coming out of um, our understanding of the direction of the global economy over the last 30 years and the problems it has been posing, particularly for, de for developing countries. And, and so one of those, of course, is the need to repair the multilateral financial system, which we don't see as working in a way that is, is helping developing countries. I, again, uh, this is, you, will be, you, will, you will get a flavor of this kind of work from colleagues who, who do more detailed presentations, but, but we have been pushing, you know, one of the things that we've been pushing is the need for a debt, a sovereign debt workout mechanism. As, as sovereign debt, as debt has increased, um, it, uh, the, the ability, the, the, the potential for debt crises has, inc has also increased. And we, there, uh, uh, and while at the national level, all serious capitalist economies have, uh, have rules on on bankruptcy and dealing with bankruptcy in an efficient and relatively fair and transparent way, there is no equivalent of those rules at the international level for handling sovereign debt crises. And UNCTAD has been pushing this idea of a, of a, of a missing component in the f international financial system around uh, a debt workout mechanism since the, since the debt crisis of the 1980s. And, and we s continue to believe that in its absence, debt will be m badly handled. Sovereign debt restructuring will, and we know it is. I mean, look at Greece, right? It's appalling. I mean, I mean, Tusk can send out tweets saying well done to the Greeks, but anyone who looks at that process knows that it has been uh, horrendous uh, in terms of the impact that it's had on the Greek economy and the Greek people. Um, so that's an area that we will do. The, the need for real, reliable, long-term development finance on a on a on a predictable basis continues the world bank does not provide that that's why uh, countries have been willing to go to china for the bri and other things to fund infrastructure uh, projects we need to look at that again we need to look at the whole issue of liquidity and the way in which uh, we have a system that tends to be highly pro cyclical when it comes to the provision of liquidity very easy in good times, very difficult in bad times, the opposite of what is needed and we need to think. And, and of course the whole crisis response mechanism and the way that austerity it very quickly becomes the way in which uh, uh, financial crises are managed. Okay, all, so these are issue changes in the architecture that we think about and, 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 and are doing research on. The whole policy space question, as I kind of indicated one of the features of hyperglobalization has been to reduce policy space to the detriment of countries managing their uh, integration into the global economy also dealing with large international uh, firms that have become in many respects their own governance systems and 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 again to the detriment of most developing countries and and i can i guess ambitiously beyond that the real need to to think about what a progressive multilateralism would be for the 21st century if you do, if you if it's if it's a plague on both the houses of na xenophobic nationalism and free trade internationalism which and i think it is a plague on both those houses then what is the alternative what is a progressive multilateralism for the 21st century and and we that was why i in my musical 
suggestion was uh, Bruce Springsteen's the, the Ghost of Tom Joad because the New Deal, the idea of a global New Deal, Tom Joad was a character from Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, for those that don't know it. Um, the, n the idea of a New Deal, and a particularly a global New Deal, was something that we raised in last year's Trade and Development Report as a different way of thinking about the challenges facing countries at different levels of development in, in, the global, in, in a global context. And, and that is something that we are trying to push forward um, in the work that we're doing now in the, in, in the division. So I guess, I guess that's about it from me. Um, so any questions, I'm happy to answer. Am I doing? I, am I self-moderating? Yeah. I mean, if if markets can't self-regulate, I'm not sure <laughs> why why uh, speakers can, but I'm happy to do so. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Richard, for your talk. Um, may I just ask you what you think of when we talk about um, the role of transnational corporations for international development? Um, if there is a difference between these high-tech corporations that come up like the Googles, Amazons, um, Facebooks, and so on, and those corporations which actually produce stuff um, like, I don't know, big automotive corporations, for, for example, um, do you think that with the shift towards the knowledge economy, the role of um, those c companies that produce commodities will diminish com compared to the others, or uh, what are the implications of both uh, industries or both types of um, corporations for, for development? I'll take a couple, I guess, off you and then. Day three and then. Um, thank you very much for um, this very interesting talk. Uh, my name is Amarili Sabreu. I come from the University of Turin, where I do a PhD in law, and I look at the sovereign debt resolution mechanism. Um, you didn't mention um, human rights in the whole of your talk. Uh, in my research, I am looking at the moment at the core decisions of the European Court of Human Rights um, in terms of austerity measures. And the message that's coming out of that core, which is one of the most um, influential ones in the topic, um, is very strong and interesting in terms of the validation of the austerity policies that they are making through their judgments. Um, so I was wondering if UNTACT at some point will, will look into this connection, which I believe is, is very important in the conversation of the sovereign debt resolution mechanism. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, shall I, I'll, I'll take those three, okay. Um, the, on the, on the question, that again, the TNCs and whether the digital, I mean, for us, the, the digital, interestingly, the digital, um, the super platforms and, and the digital firms are, in a way, an exaggerated version of other, I mean, and, and we try and make this case in this year's Trade and Development Report, that, that given the nature of their, um, the, the, the asset that they control to make profits, which is data, Right. They, 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 this is the, 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 the controlling data is how digital firms make their money, and data is a very peculiar kind of asset, and it lends itself very strongly both to monopolizing tendencies and to rent-seeking behavior. And 
And so we, we, we in, in the rise of the digital firm, um, we see an exaggerated version of a lot of, uh, of, of corporate, beha corporate behavior more generally. So, so we don't see them as being a, a different kind of animal from, from, other, from other TNCs. We see them very much as, in, as, as, as indicative of the kinds of dangers that unregulate. There's nothing wrong. We, I, we're not kind of anti-big business. We're anti-big unregulated business. That is, the, the danger is the, the, the lack of regulation and the, la the lack of countervailing pa power of these large firms, which is when, when they can become predatory and dangerous. And of course, there is a real problem. I mean, we, 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 we've been taken by the phrase introduced, interestingly enough, by um, Zingales, who is a Chicago economist, um, uh, who's introduced this idea of what he calls the Medici vicious circle. That is the way in which economic power captures political power in this day and age reinforcing economic power in a vicious circle, like the Medici's, right? Like, like 16th century Florence, when the Medici family was doing this, um, and many other things um, uh, 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 back then. And so he, he talks about, and so this idea of a Medici vicious cycle in which these firms have become so large and so powerful that they can capture political processes, including at the international level, is something that certainly worries us um, uh, uh, a lot and is, is part of the work that we're doing. But I'm not conv convinced that they're different. I mean, interestingly enough, what, one of the things we've tried to show in this, in this year's trade and development report is the way in which, in, in global value chains in general, the, the rise of rent-seeking behavior of the lead firms and global value chains are character wh whatever the activity whether it's in digital or 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 textiles or or chemicals or automobiles they are driven by these lead what what the traditional literature call lead firm because lead firm sounds kind of innocuous right you're the lead firm, like the lead goose in a in a thing that sounds all right Right? There's, no, there's no suggestions of power or asymmetries between the lead firm. It's, it's nice. Lead firm's kind of nice. You know? we, we all like leaders. Yeah. Um, in fact, in fact you know, the lead firms are these very large multinational corporations with rent-seeking proclivities. And what we've tried to show, and I mean, this is empirical work that we've done, is the way in which the lead firms are monopolizing essentially the, t the ends of the chains, that is in the pre-production and the post-production stages. Uh, and this is, amazingly, this is work that Heimer was talking about back in the 1970s. So you control, you control finance and planning at the beginning of the process, and you control marketing and distribution at the end. And you can, in those two areas, you can make huge rents. And in the process, you hollow out the value that takes place in production. And, and so, and, 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 and we see that as being a, a common feature of global value chains in the contemporary era, with huge distributional, con with huge consequences for income, uh, income distribution, and completely against what the neoclassical tradition uh, uh, of trade theory, w theory would predict about uh, the consequences of trade and distribution. So, so this is, we don't, you know, uh, the digital firms have their own peculiarities, but they're very much part of this hyper-globalized world. Rana Faruha, who, who, I mean, if Rana Faruha, who is a lead, edit, a lead writer in the, in the Financial Times who focuses on digital, and she's excellent, actually. And she has one today on the trap of Amazon's pricing tactics, about the way Amazon is playing off, Gary must know this better than me, playing off American cities in, 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 its, in the location of its second headquarters and doing two things, right, interestingly, getting these cities to give them money, first of all, and second of all, undermining the tax base on which uh, 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 municipal services depend. Have we seen this before? Of course we've seen it. This is what developing countries have been suffering from with these countries for 70 years, right, even more so now. 
So, you know, this is an interesting way in which the South is now coming back into the North in the hyper-globalized era. Nice piece by Rana, N nice piece. So, no, it's not, we're not, we're not, we, yes, there are differences and, and, and the knowledge economy has its own important technological dimensions that it's important to talk about. But when you're looking at the behavior of firms, uh, which is what we should be doing, lots of similarities, I think, there. Um, the, the, the role of China, I think um, the interesting thing for us about China and its influence on the developing world is whether or not, not, not whether it can lend money to build bridges. That's not unimportant because many developing countries have been starved of access to uh, long-term infrastructure financing for a long time. The World Bank got out of this business in the 1970s, went into adjustment lending, poverty lending, social lending, and away from what it was set up to do. It was set up to do infrastructure lending, but, but in the neoliberal world, it has not moved in that direction. It's, it's being forced back into that by China, which is probably a good thing. But what, what is important for us is that China's own experience of using infrastructure as part of its development process is disseminated to the countries that it's lending to. So in, infrastructure essentially um, emerges successfully out of uh, a, a kind of coming together of three processes. One is obviously mobilizing financial resources. One is effective planning, not only project planning, but that's important, but also the way in which uh, infrastructure links to a wider development strategy, so planning in that kind of classical sense of the term, um, and industrial policy, right? Uh, because infrastructure is important as part of a diversification strategy. And China had all those three things. In I mean, uh, and we can, you can debate whether there's, I mean, l lots of mistakes in China, it's, I mean, and the, the Chinese themselves aware, uh, are aware of, but they didn't think of infrastructure as an asset class. Right, which is how it's being presented in the financial institutions in Washington. Think of, think, just think of infrastructure as an asset class, and then you can bring in the private sector, and they will make sure that the efficient delivery of this particular asset will take place. That's, that's the model that is being presented by the Washington-based uh, institutions, and it has its wrinkles in public-private partnerships and blended finance and the whole litany of financial ideas that have come out of these institutions over the course of the last 20 years. It's not what China did. It's not what China did. And w uh, what is important for us in the work that we do on the Belt, of Ro Belt and Road is whether we can use China's own experience uh, in, in using infrastructure as part of its development agenda uh, in other countries, essentially, in the countries that are now um, uh, heavily indebted to China, some of them as a consequence of infrastructure borrowing. So that, that's, that's the way in which we're trying to look at this, uh, uh, the, the, the China. Does Trump change? Trump does change this. Trump, Trump changes this. Trump will, I think, force China in, I mean, you know, Trump's agenda is, is as much as anything about China, he you know, is against China. It's, uh, he's, the, the American big business is worried about China. And Trump reflects that. That's what he's a reflection of. Um, and why? Because China is now moving into areas in the high value added, high technology parts of the global economy where these firms make most of their money. I mean, crudely. And, 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 and so that's, and it's not, and, and this is the, you know, everyone blames Trump for the, the Europeans are just as culpable in this in this story as Trump. They, 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 they also, and this is, this is what is uh, really kind of frustrating us, I'll be honest with you, because, you know, in, in many respects, so, so, what, so what the debate is led by Trump is how do we stop other countries doing what China has done, which is a weird thing to, given that China has lifted 700 million people out of poverty, it's a kind of weird thing that you want to stop, right? I mean, it's an it's a incredible success story. So why, w rather than wanting to stop this, you'd think, well, let's, how can we replicate this experience across the, uh, normal, normal people, uh, normal inverted commas, would, would, that's what you'd want to do, right? I mean, it's an amazing achievement, you know, it's, it's, and, 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 but no, they don't want to do this partly because of the Medici vicious circle, in my opinion, that is, these policymakers are captured in the north. Um, 
but if you look at, Ch I mean, if you look at China's agenda, for example, what, what do they want to stop in the w WTO reform is called, they want to stop state-owned enterprises, subsidize, subsidies of one kind or another, um, technology transfer by leaning on firms that are making money in your country, they don't want that, or stronger intellectual property rights, all the things that European economies did themselves in the post-war period, right? All European economies use state-owned enterprises. They used weak intellectual property. They subsidized their industries like hell. So all the things that there was, it's, this is back to Ha Jun and he's kicking away the ladder. This is the, all the things that China did, uh, we've seen before. We've seen before as part of successful development stories, including in, in Western Europe. And now what does Western Europe want to do? They want to reform the WTO so other countries can't do that. I mean, this is the kind of hypocrisy that comes out of the hyper-globalization agenda. Trump is disrupting that in his own way, and he's forcing developing countries, I think, because developing countries have been very passive in the WTO for too long. They're forcing developing countries to think about these issues again, and that's a good thing. I mean, Trump, I don't think Trump, uh, it's not, it's not, his, it's clearly not his intention, and I'm not even sure he knows what he's doing, but, but it's, it's, it's a good thing. At that level, that kind of disruption is a good thing. And it's going to force China as well to think about these issues in this context a little bit harder. And I, I welcome, uh, personally, I welcome that kind of change. The human rights story is a difficult one for us. It's difficult because, not because it's unimportant, which is not, and we have been, for example, involved with the right to development in UNCLAD, we, the right to development is part of this agenda. It's, it, it's difficult because large parts of the human rights agenda, for me, are part of the neoliberal agenda. And many of the discussions that I hear in human rights make me uncomfortable because they're about, they're about, they're essentially about controlling states through the international architecture. And I, I, you know, I, I'm a strong believer that, you know, we, the, the state, the state is a very, is one of the great human inventions, institutional inventions. And it's not just that, you know, the Hobbesian argument that, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a weak state world, life is nasty, brutish and short or whatever Hobbes said. It's that states make, states are essential for the development process. And a lot of the, too much now, too much, of the human, too much of the human rights agenda that we hear is about bashing states. And that makes me nervous and uncomfortable. Now, you're, there, is a, there, is a, there is a progressive side to the human rights agenda. And we work with, for example, the rapporteur on debt, who is a former colleague of ours from, from UNCTAD, Juan Pablo. So we work, we, work with, we work with those people um, closely, actually. Um, but it's not the, the human rights agenda and the development agenda are, if not uncomfortable bedfellows, then they're not natural bedfellows. And there's tensions in that discussion that often come out. And it's worth a, long, it's worth a, it's worth a bigger discussion, but but it's something that we struggle with. I, 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 I'll, I'll, be honest, I'll be honest with you in terms of thinking about, you know, the right. I don't, I, per, you know, for example, I don't think countries have a right to development. I don't think they have a right to development. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it means anything, actually. Rights means that there are, that there's, there's a set of rules, there's enforcement, there's adjudicate. You don't have that with development. That's, that's not what development is about. And so we worry a little bit about the human rights. I mean, I appreciate that there is a dimension to the human rights agenda that is much closer to us in, in terms of, and particularly the rapporteurs in the council here on, on issues of austerity. You have a human rights um, uh, rapporteur talking about poverty and the way in which austerity is undermining attempts to alleviate poverty. I mean, these are important contributions to the debate, but there are, there, I'm not, they're only one part of the human rights story, and we, we get into conflict with the other, with some of those parts. Is that it? Three minutes? No? no. Yeah. Yeah, sure.
I dropped something. Hi, my name is Devika. I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And um, I really enjoyed your talk. And um, partly because I don't know, it's validating as a heterodox economist to see a policy organization like Young Tad, like I know it's been doing it for a long time, uh, having the discussions that we are, and you're talking about progressive multilat multilateralism. But at the same time, I wonder, um, several times during your talk, you said, we've been ahead of the curve, we've been ahead of the curve, and we have been ahead of the curve, but to what extent has it helped our global economic order and I, I wonder, has there been ebbs and flows in which there's the global economic order or new economic order has been interested in how we've been ahead of the curve? Has it, and I'm sure it has, like pushing the frontier of knowledge in any, I think is good. Uh, that's the academic in me talking. But at the same time, how quickly does it have real effects in, well, partner organizations like the World Bank and IMF, which are actually loaning out money, which, frankly, is a big, so bigger source of power than knowledge. So I was wondering what you think about that. Thanks. Yeah, last one, I guess, right, Benjamin? Uh, uh, quick question. Uh, I believe uh, uh, I, I just want you to know your, your thought about uh, how this uh, uh, hi uh, hyper-globalized hyper, hyper financial uh, system could affect the productive sector uh, in the developing countries, specifically uh, to to the possibility of the pro of the productive sector in the in the developing uh, in the developing country to be linked with the with the global value chains, uh, and I I also uh, want to know the name of the empirical report that you mentioned about the the, the uh, about the global value chains. Okay, uh, and just quickly, the, the Trade and Development Report, which is our annual report that comes out, it will come out in three weeks' time, the, the 2018 version. I mean, there are lots of channels through which hyperglobalization has an impact, I think, through the value chain story. I mean, I mean one is the policy space. What the, what the one is the way in which it whittles away at policy space and the ability of, com of countries to pressurize um, uh, uh, multinationals to do the things that is a, in a sense promised. That is, you know, when you invite a firm into your country because they have things that you don't have, that's why you invite them in, right? That you want them, and you want the technology, you want the marketing channels, uh, you want the skills that they have to be to be to spill over to your producers. That's that's. I mean, th th they bring capital, but not very much often. But that those are the. And, but that does not happen automatically. I mean, the history of, of, of um, hosting foreign direct investment is a history of countries being able, in a sense, to force these firms to, to do these things. It, doesn't, it simply doesn't happen automatically. And when we look at the countries that have successfully used FDI, most recently China, but before that East Asian countries, but other countries too, they've, they've had the policies, whether it's joint ventures, or te technology agreements, all kinds of things that have been used to do that. One of the features of the hyperglobalization is to reduce the power of government to do it, and they do that through through free trade agreements. But they also do it because when capital is highly mobile, and it's it, it has a threat over you that it's just going to leave. I mean, it's a in a highly mobile world, the threat of leaving is a very powerful one that firms bring to the table. So, so, you know, once you lose capital controls and other means of, of, of embedding uh, uh, corporations in your economic context, you, you lose policy space in all kinds of ways. And that's something that worries us, and we've, we've done work on that. The other, the other way, of course, it, the other way in which financialization could adversely impact is through this, the, uh, um, the paradox of a hyper-globalized world and a heavily financialized world um, often sold on the promise that that's a world that's good for investment. I mean, if a world in which finance is given a free hand is a world, they say, with deeper financial markets that is good for investing. It's a pro-investment world. The great irony of this world is that as finance has mushroomed, productive investment has often declined and that they're not working in tandem in any way. And that's a, fe that's a paradox that I think will be talked about by people subsequently. But, but it's not... Having a highly financial, 
financialized world is not necessarily a world which has a strong investment drive. And if you're going to benefit from global value chains, obviously you need this, br this environment in which your own domestic firms are in a position to be able to grow and, 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 and develop, which requires capital, I mean productive capital. And if, and if you have an environment that works against that, you're going to have problems. So we, we've done this. this is the, these are the kinds of stories that we are trying to tell in the work that we do on, on global value chains. Why, in, why industrial policy is so important to, to, to benefiting from that. In terms of the just uh, the, yeah, yeah, of course, of course it's frustrating. I mean, UNCTAD, of course, is slightly unique because we were set up by developing countries. We're not an academic. We, we didn't. We were set up by developing countries. So the G77 gives us the political support. Now, one of the f our frustrations is that the G77 has become a much less solidaristic, coherent um, uh, force in in the in the negotiating arena than it was at the time UNCTAD was set up. But you know, it's my. I'll, you know, and so yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Um, but you know things change. You know, I'll I'll, do, I'll say it again. It's my favorite quote from Bertolt Brecht: "Because things are the way they are, things will not stay the way they are." And there are enough contradictions in this world that people are having to struggle with. But they look for options, as they did in 2008, 2009. Options were required, as they are beginning to think now about the need to readdress the problems of market concentration, and monopoly capital as people are trying to deal with that problem. And that gives heterodox economists, who tend to have done much more work on these things than orthodox, it gives you an opportunity, a space, to present an alternative thinking and alternative uh, policy options. Um, so thank you, Richard. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, I sent an email with an updated program because we had a, a couple of uh, last minute uh, events. So uh, it's, it's in your email and also it's in the last version that was printed out uh, there. Uh, given the initial delay that, that we have, uh, I suggest that uh, let's take a coffee break now and we'll resume at 11.45 uh, uh, a.m. for the next uh, presentation. Um, so if you have any questions or need any information, uh, please come. So, uh, oh, also, the, if you want coffee, there is a coffee bar just down the hall uh, to, the, uh, to the left. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the cafeteria doesn't accept uh, uh, cards or Bitcoin, so <laughs> you are going to have to need uh, uh, hardcore cash. Uh, there is an ATM on the second floor. <laughs>